people whose duties include the handling and sorting of mail should be aware of the dangers of letter bombs and the correct procedures for dealing with them. Letter bombs are designed to kill and maim and just two ounces of high explosive is enough to achieve this aim. However, they're dispatched with the intention that they only detonate if opened by the recipient. Therefore, any explosive device which has survived the rigors of the post should be safe unless interfered with. Any letter or package which arouses suspicion should be handled as little as possible. Ideally, the letter should be placed on a table away from windows and thin partition walls. The room should then be locked and the Building Incident Controller, BIC for short, must be informed of the suspect package and its location. However, to avoid unnecessary alarm and disruption to operations, as well as wasting the bomb disposal officer's time, every effort should be made to authenticate the genuineness of any suspect package. If the sender's particulars are shown on the package, inquiry should be made in this direction. On no account should any suspect letter bomb be prodded, folded, cut, or otherwise interfered with. Neither should it be placed in sand or water or in a metal container, which would only enhance the effects of an explosion by providing shrapnel. A number of aerosol devices are available on the market, which, when sprayed on the envelope, make it translucent so that the contents can be seen. These can be very dangerous and must not be used. If the device is spring-operated, for example, it may weaken the paper and allow the spring to push through, thus activating the device or it may interfere with the electrical circuit, again initiating an explosion. Great care must be taken with any suspicious package that's delivered by hand, as it may be a time control device rather than one activated through the action of opening it. In such instances, the building incident controller must be informed immediately, as evacuation may have to be considered. This is the typical contents of a post bag delivered to the post room. Any suspicious letters or packages could be identified here. Let's now look at the other indications which can alert people to the possibility of a letter bomb, bearing in mind that these are guidelines only and are not set in tablets of stone. This poster should be displayed in the post room as a constant reminder to staff of the letter bomb threat, as well as detailing the warning indications. It can be obtained from most police forces and must be replaced when worn or faded so as to retain its credibility. Look closely at this package. The greasy marks on the wrapping have been caused by commercial explosives, such as gelignite sweating. Sweating occurs because some explosives absorb moisture from the air and later release it to give this greasy effect. No greasy marks doesn't mean no explosives. It could have been wrapped in greaseproof paper or plastic explosives used which do not sweat. Commercial explosives also give off an aroma similar to marzipan or almonds and again this could arouse suspicion. If a package containing an explosive device is received in this state it could be very unstable and should be left where found without further inquiry. The room should be locked and the building incident controller informed immediately. Pinholes in a package could be an indication of a device, as with some types, a pin is removed at the last stage of preparation before dispatch. If a letter is lopsided or has an uneven weight distribution, this could point to the contents being suspect. Also, rigid contents, such as depicted here in a flexible envelope, could be another indication of an explosive device. The package shown here has excessive wrapping, this could be a determination on the part of the terrorist to make sure that it arrives at its destination undamaged. Or it could be a spring-loaded device and the wrapping is required to retain the springs until the package is opened by the recipient. Excess weight can be an indication of a device. Look out for envelopes which are not suited to the weight. We would not expect to receive a package from another member of the business community with the addressee's particulars so badly typed. Terrorists are not necessarily illiterate, but neither are they trained secretaries. Poor spelling and handwriting is not the norm in the business community, 
and a package with this appearance would stand out from the rest of the mail. The package here has far too many stamps for the weight and more money than necessary has been spent on postage. This happens because the terrorist is reluctant to visit a post office to have it weighed. Accordingly, he purchases a large number of stamps and to ensure delivery affixes more than are required. The postmark on the stamps can be an indicator of terrorist activity. When the provisional IRA have mounted letter bomb campaigns in the past, they've originated on the continent, especially Belgium. This apparently innocent cigar box could in reality be quite a large explosive device. Any box of this nature could disguise a bomb. However, anybody receiving this particular package should have realized that the excessive weight was not commensurate with a box of cigars. Here are some of the components required to make a high explosive device. Explosives, detonators and wiring. A power source would also be needed to manufacture a postal bomb and this is not shown. A book or a thick magazine is the classic postal bomb. Here is a hollowed out book which has been filled with explosives. It also contains a battery and a detonator. The wiring leads to two contacts which are located opposite each other. A piece of stiff card is placed between the pages to keep the contacts apart and the bottom of the card is glued to the bottom of the envelope. When the envelope is opened and the book is withdrawn, the card remains in the envelope. As a result, the contacts touch, complete the electrical circuit and initiate the explosion. As a rule, mechanical aids are not considered necessary for BT post rooms. But if a building incident controller considers that he or she has a special case, Security and Investigation Division, CPSQ, should be consulted. A metal detector, as the term implies, detects metal. It does not detect bombs. Thus, it would not detect a chemical bomb unless it had some metal content. They also pick up any metal and are subject to false activations caused by paper clips or other small innocent pieces of metal. Again, this is a metal detector, but it's more sophisticated as it recognizes metal when formatted as a circuit. It's much more expensive than the ones just shown. Here we see a vapor analyzer, or sniffer as it's widely termed. They will only detect commercial explosives and not plastic. Not really designed for letter bomb detection and very expensive at about 5,000 pounds. The fluoroscope, or as it's better known, the X-ray machine. It's the only reliable means of bomb detection. However, the operators must be properly trained so that they can accurately interpret the X-ray images. Here is the book mentioned earlier, together with an X-ray image obtained by submitting it to fluoroscope examination. As the terrorist can build a booby trap letter bomb by incorporating a photoelectric cell designed to explode when X-rayed, the machines are located in secure rooms with remote control facility. Some building incident controllers may wish the post room staff to mark letters clear of suspicion before forwarding them to the recipients. This is purely optional. Remember, these warning indicators are guidelines only and do not necessarily mean that a package displaying the indications is an explosive device. Conversely, an explosive device may be delivered which bears none of the warning signs discussed. Okay, we're straight there. Alpha 1 1, Alpha 1 2, Alpha 1 5, Charlie 5 1. Fire, telephone exchange setting. Alpha 1 1, Alpha 1 2, Alpha 1 5, Charlie 5 1. Fire, telephone exchange setting. Is no ordinary call out. A fire in a telephone 
exchange can present hazards not usually encountered elsewhere. Telephone exchanges such as this process and connect many thousands of messages each day. These range from domestic calls between friends and relatives through business and international communications to public utilities and emergency services. In other words, telephone exchanges are vital to the smooth running of the country. So it's important that BT and the fire brigades work together to ensure any incident is contained and dealt with as effectively as possible. BT is committed to helping the brigades achieve this goal. Chris Earnshaw, Managing Director of BT Worldwide Networks, told me just what this commitment means. BT's UK communication network is extensive and highly complex. Our operational buildings are a fundamental part of this infrastructure and despite precautions, we still have fires. Fires not only pose a potential threat to BT people, but can also have a serious impact on our customers. They range from the small residential telephone user to large businesses who depend heavily on our network for telephony and data services. A rapid and effective response to exchange fires is essential if we're to protect vital services. We've therefore embarked upon a major program to install automatic smoke detection at our exchanges. And in support of this, we wish to work with local authority fire brigades in pre-fire planning. Working as a team, we can assist the professional firefighter in developing and maintaining an understanding of our exchanges. And this will help minimise the risk to not only BT people, but the firefighters themselves. One of the practical problems experienced by fire brigades is ensuring that firefighters maintain an up-to-date knowledge of the layout of telephone exchanges and the hazards to be encountered inside them. It doesn't matter whether the exchange in question is in an urban, suburban or rural location. The overall design is similar. There's no substitute for personal inspections, so let's take a look at this typical exchange and see just where some of the potential hazards are located. This is the cable chamber, and it's where telephone cables enter and leave the exchange. It's usually to be found in the basement. Be aware that gas and flammable vapours may be present. As with cables throughout an exchange, the older ones are made of conventional materials and have a higher propensity to burn, whilst newer types are constructed using fire retardant compounds. However, they do have the disadvantage of producing heavier smoke during a fire. From here, the cables travel to the main distribution frame, usually found on the floor above. And it's in this area that the calls are routed to the telephone switching equipment rooms via cable runways. Cables carrying trunk calls terminate in the telephone repeater station, where there are similar cable runways to the switching equipment. On the whole, exchange fires are not fast moving, but these runways could aid the spread of a fire more quickly than in other areas, and cable transits passing through elements of the structure are fire stopped to at least a one hour standard. Therefore, the cable chamber, the main distribution frame, and the telephone repeater station are generally the areas of highest concentration where even a minor fire would have serious consequences. At this point, I want to draw your attention to what is potentially the most hazardous aspect of an exchange. It's a factor to be considered in almost any area. I'm referring, of course, to an exchange's power supply. As with most industrial buildings, heavy mechanical equipment is run on 240 to 415 volts. But in larger buildings, 11,000 volts may be present. In addition, the distribution, switching and transmission areas operate on 50 volts DC. 
This supply is converted from the mains, but in the case of a mains failure, a standby generator like this will automatically start up and take over. As a last resort, if the standby generator also fails, power is supplied for a limited period by rack-mounted batteries within the equipment area itself, or from a dedicated battery room such as this, or this. What this does mean, however, is that most areas of an exchange cannot easily be electrically isolated. In other words, don't assume if mains power has been cut that a zero volt situation exists. If there is a fire here in the battery room itself, spraying the cells with water may produce arcing, but the voltages encountered are small. However, the potential danger from high, short circuit currents should not be overlooked. The use of a fog nozzle in fighting fires in any energized equipment minimizes the chances of receiving a severe electric shock. If hydrogen gas is present, there is an intendant risk of explosion. Wet cell fires can also create acidic fumes that cause skin and eye irritation. Breathing apparatus may become contaminated in this environment. Returning to the calls passing through an exchange, they are routed from distribution areas to the switching equipment area, which consists of a maze of racks set up in aisles. They are of different widths. Some are wide, like this. Others are narrower. Now picture the situation of a firefighter using breathing apparatus in this area. He can pass down the wider aisles quite comfortably. But there is a very real danger of being trapped in one of the narrow ones. A good rule of thumb is to walk down an aisle with elbows raised. If it's possible to touch either side, then this is likely to be a narrow aisle. So move to the next one. Running along the top of the racks, there may be bus bars, and they pose another potential threat. Remember, never assume a zero volt area, so they could be live even after mains isolation. Therefore, short circuiting can lead to this result. I started off by saying how vital telephone exchanges are to the community and that a fire could seriously disrupt that service. However, the incorrect selection of an extinguishing agent can be just as bad. Fires located around equipment areas should, if possible, be fought using clean agents such as Halon 1211 BCF or CO2. Water, dry agents or foam will physically damage the equipment and interrupt communications. Also, be aware that in modern exchanges, the power supply to the racks may be housed in cabinets such as these. In the heat of the moment, they could be easily overlooked. The application of water would not normally be lethal, but could produce arcing and electric shock. In addition to these specific hazards, exchanges also house dangers common to other buildings. For example, the air conditioning plant employs some high-pressure pipe work. Lasers are frequently to be found, but these areas are clearly marked thus. And more and more common are the use of computer terminals. So, in summary, what are the main characteristics that distinguish exchange fires from others? Firstly, very few personnel are usually on site, so firefighters can quickly concentrate on saving property. Secondly, exchange fires are usually slow-moving, but they have the disadvantage of producing heavy smoke. Thirdly, it has been found that in some areas, firefighters may be unfamiliar with exchange layouts and the type of equipment and power supplies in use. Fourthly, some areas make maneuvering difficult, especially when wearing bulky or restrictive equipment. Fifthly, remember that the extinguishing agent used may cause more damage than the fire itself. Sixth and finally, even though mains power has been turned off, some areas may still be live. From this, I think you'll agree that it's important that BT and the brigades work together. And one way to do this is for BT to furnish and make available as much information as possible about its exchanges, so that pre-fire plans can be drawn up. 
This programme has gone some way in highlighting areas of concern, but there's no substitute to making first-hand inspections. Therefore, BT welcomes 11D inspections of all operational buildings. To explain just how important these inspections are is Assistant Chief Fire Officer John Terry. First-hand knowledge of the people and hazards likely to be encountered in any building is invaluable to firefighters when responding to an emergency call. However, the practicality of all firefighters achieving and then maintaining this information for all relevant buildings within their area of operation is virtually impossible. We therefore need to reinforce the special risk or 111 inspection with the recording of information using a standard format from which fire plans may be made. In this instance, we've worked very closely with the local BT management in order to provide a specific fire pack which is available to firefighters on arrival at the premises. Regular exercises have validated the plans and from a fire service viewpoint, we are in a much better position to deal effectively with an incident at a telephone exchange in this area from both the safety of personnel and damage limitation points of view. To aid fire crews, BT will be providing a fire pack like this located at each major site. It's clearly marked and each contains critical information relevant to firefighters in that particular exchange. Close by you'll find the alarm, fire detection and smoke detection panels where they have been provided. Colin Hallett is manager estate security for BT and knows the importance the company attaches to fire packs. In conjunction with the fire brigade, we hold regular full-scale exercises. These are useful in identifying any weaknesses in the operation of the scheme and further reinforce the brigade and BT's ability to deal with a serious fire. Interestingly, with exercises already held, we have identified several problems that were not previously apparent. For example, when passing the initial 999 call to the brigade, fire brigade please. an incorrect or incomplete now address the has fire been given, telephone exchange. resulting in unnecessary um, delay in the fire straight. appliances responding. Yes. Similarly, BT jargon has been used, such as TE, TRS, etc. And clearly, the brigade do not understand these terms. There is no doubt that this initiative has helped forge a very positive working relationship with the Brigade. It also enables BT people to gain an appreciation of how major fires would be tackled if the worst were to happen. Careful pre-fire planning is essential to successful firefighting. And cooperation between fire brigades and BT will enable that preparation to be as comprehensive as possible. I started by saying that telephone exchanges provided vital communication links to the community. To ensure those links don't fail, there must be another between BT and the fire brigades. Together, we too shall form the vital link. is that I have a board meeting. Yes, Mr.
here, Gladys? Except for Judy. She insisted on staying up there to deal with the emergency calls. She could be an emergency herself if this was a real fire. All right, on your floor, was this? Yes. What about disabled? Just for you. That's Fred, the FPO, our fire precautions officer, a very important man in any organization, though not the most popular one at this particular moment. However, part of his job is to arrange fire doors, like this one. There's quite a few missing, aren't there? Some people don't take it that seriously, do they? Well, they'll always be idiots. And would you shift your motor? It's blocking a fire door. I keep telling you. More importantly, Fred has to prevent fires by knowing what hazards to look out for. He requires special training for that. He has to try and develop the right attitudes in other people. That requires cooperation, which he doesn't always get. Because the fact is, for most people, complying with fire regulations is a nuisance, particularly for overzealous security men like Bert here. Easy-going characters like this one. Anxious sales supervisors and their secretaries. Hard-working porters, busy AMC operators. Rather foolish AMC operators. And even senior management, where you might really expect to find support. So what exactly is the problem? The cable holes in A block need to be stopped, the material has arrived, but it needs fitting. Is that it? Yes. Well, tell Higgs. I already have, three times. Very well. Leave it to me. Uh, the other thing is, I'm going to a fire prevention seminar for two days on Monday. So you're going to need a replacement? Right. Very well, I'll find someone. It has come at an awkward time. Well, no time's the right time, is it? I sometimes wonder if all these fire precautions aren't counterproductive. We are a competitive organisation now, after all. All right. Anything else? No. Except you weren't at the fire drill. And you really should have been, if you don't mind me saying so. I am responsible for everyone, even senior management. You've got to learn a thing like them. Think daft. I mean, we've all done daft things in our time. We've all created fire hazards. We've used faulty electrical appliances or propped doors open with fire extinguishers. Been very careless where we've thrown our cigarette ends, left flammable material lying around like stationary, cardboard boxes and so on. And that's what you've got to watch for. Not in yourselves, of course. As we all know different, don't we? And in other people. Right? Right, just before we break, anybody got any questions? No? Yes? Can you answer me this? If I were to do my FPO job really well, I'd need to be at it full time. With staff, a realistic budget and management support, right? Well, an ideal world, yes. And if I don't have enough time or encouragement to do my FPO duties properly, I might just as well not bother at all. I wouldn't agree with you there. I mean, if a job's worth doing, and it is, then it's worth doing properly, with proper cooperation and proper management support. I grant you it's not always easy. <laughs> no, it's not easy. It's impossible. No one listens. No one pays any attention. I mean, the goes I've had at people, pointing out the dangers, getting up tight, even sticking my neck out with management. <laughs> and for all the notice they take, I might as well not exist. OK, let's leave it there for the moment, shall we? We'll break now. This afternoon, there's a first aid firefighting demonstration in the yard at 2.15. I'll see you all then, OK? Might as well not exist. He doesn't know what he's saying. Well, certainly the job can be frustrating sometimes, but might as well not exist. <laughs> Does he have any idea what would happen if he wasn't the fire precautions officer? If someone hadn't bothered to appoint him? Have you any idea? Well, if you've ever been in a fire, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't, we'll have a look at one in a minute. But first of all, I'd like you to think about what happens when a fire begins. 
how it starts by someone behaving foolishly, stupidly, maybe not even caring. And I shall be their sort of, their sort of conscience. Well, you can't expect them to admit it, can you? Hmm? All right, well, go on, up your end. All right, that's it. Oh, Lord, you stand. <laughs> Anyone would think this is Fort Knox. As far as I'm concerned, it is. There's a hundred million quids worth of equipment up there. So if I'm security man, then to hell with anyone else. I'm going to keep this door well and truly locked. Well, aren't I? <laughs> you can bet on me. See how it works? A fire door that has to be kept closed. A fire extinguisher that hasn't been checked in years. Which means there's going to be a very funny moment when someone tries to use it. And did you see the way I threw away my cigarette, eh? Oh, this has real possibilities. I kid you not. Beep, beep. Hello? What's this? Grand National Day? Can you tell me where I can put them then? Don't tempt me. Oh, very nice. Yes. Where do you want it, Mr. Dixon? Oh, uh, put it over there against the door, will you? When's the new desk coming, Fred? Should have been here by last week. Could you chase them? Certainly will, Mr. Dixon. Instead of a new desk, I'd have done much better to use the money for more cabinets to store that bump outside. Like the one that's blocking my fire exit door, which incidentally is all glued up with paint. It's getting very interesting, wouldn't you say? Come in. Here's your smart new multicaster executive chair, Mr. Foster. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. Oh, uh, Fred, uh, there are two things. Uh, there's a cracked pane of glass. I'll oh, very soon fix that, Mr. Foster. Ah, good. And uh, an unusual request, perhaps, but uh, you don't know anyone who could take over the job of um, fire precautions, officer? I don't, Mr. Foster. Can't do it myself, as you know. And most people like me are too busy. But I'll certainly think about it, Mr. Foster. Well, I don't suppose it matters, really. After all, people are pretty intelligent. And we haven't had a fire since I've been here. That's been 20 years. <laughs> right you are, then, Mr. Foster. Well, I'm not going to push this FPO bit too hard, am I? Everything's going well. I'm a popular fellow. It's a nice, happy outfit. <laughs> I like it. Personal service with a smile. Oh, what a lovely mover. <laughs> What are you doing then tonight, my lovely? We're not allowed to speak to male staff without the supervisor's permission. I am the supervisor. No, the supervisor is the one behind me, waiting to kill you. Here you are, gorgeous. Hello. Hello. Well, male staff can be a distraction, of course, especially to girls. Mind you, I'm not exactly blameless myself. Uh, take these cleaning materials, for example. Definitely a fire hazard. But for something absolutely lethal, you can't beat my good old defective electric fire. Have a look at it. Works like a charm. Well, nobody's perfect. We've all got our other side, our couldn't care less side. And unless there's a Fred the FPO to keep us fire conscious, we'll get away with it. Until the day, a small fire begins. And remember, all big fires begin as little fires. And then all those scarcely thought out acts of carelessness will combine 
to cause a major disaster. And this one's just beginning. It's beginning to burn very nicely. And it's going to move very quickly. And what do you think it was caused by? Hmm? Overloaded electrical equipment? A dodgy electric fire? A blocked heat event? Maybe. Remember this? It was something very simple. Well, that was some time ago. But cigarettes often take a little while, so let's just see how it's getting on. Now, it could have been put out if proper fire precautions had been taken to prevent it from spreading. But there's no Fred the FPO, so nothing was done. Instead, we have combustible material lying around in heaps, cleaning fluids not put away, fire doors propped open, on top of which no one has ever used this for fire drills. So, when eventually someone gets it to work, instead of order and routine, there will be panic, confusion, chaos and death. Watch carefully. You'll see it all just as it happened. I should know. Emergency, which service? Emergency, which service? It's some little kitty. Are you sure? Yeah. You're sure? Right. Uh, in that case, uh, sound the alarm. Good. Sound the alarm. All right, everyone. Don't panic. I don't want anyone to panic. Don't work it, Mr. Dixon. It's not working. Nothing's happened. <laughs> Terrific alarm now. Uh, I think maybe we should ring 999. Oi! Oh, no, no, the fire people will make a hell of a mess. We've computers in here. Oh, surely we can use the fire extinguishers. Jean, warn the people upstairs. Come along, John. No, no, they'll use the phone and start rescuing the files! Personally, I think we should get the hell out. There's a little kid in trouble. Just a few minutes, OK? I'll switch the lines through. So where is your mum? She's lying on the carpet.
It isn't locked. Have you got Judy with you? Isn't she here? No. And she can't get out the other way. Oh, God. <coughs> <coughs> precautions, no drills, no proper equipment, no FPO, nothing. Bloody criminal! are designed for ease of operation in an emergency. Most fires have small beginnings, a carelessly discarded cigarette end, a faulty electrical connection or component, misuse of heaters or flammable materials. It is at the earlier stage that fires are more easily put out, and by anyone who has available the right type of fire extinguisher and the basic knowledge of how to use it. Therefore, we can say that first aid firefighting is any action that is taken by persons on the spot to contain or extinguish a fire before the arrival of the fire brigade. It's important to remember that this is a purely voluntary action and there is no compulsion or obligation on anyone's part. The safety of the individual is the first consideration. However, what everyone must do in all cases of fire, however small, is to raise the alarm and then as soon as possible call the fire brigade. Careful sighting of extinguishers is of the utmost importance. It is also important that everyone protected by these extinguishers has at least a fundamental knowledge of how they are used. Portable extinguishers are designed for quick and easy action. It's essential that the right extinguisher is placed to deal with a particular fire risk in that area. It may be useless or even dangerous to use the wrong kind of extinguishing agent on a fire. and the warnings given on the extinguisher labels and on any adjacent notices are most important. These extinguishers will now be demonstrated and the type of fire or fires they are capable of controlling will be clearly indicated. Be careful to note the method of operation. Now obviously we cannot show extinguishers from every manufacturer but generally the method of operation of each is similar and should be fairly obvious at a glance. Printed instructions or diagrams are given on extinguisher labels, which can be summarized generally by remembering to first release the safety catch or pull out the safety pin, then strike or squeeze the operating control. 
Water extinguishers are coloured red and depend upon the cooling action of water to put out the fire. They should be used only on fires that involve solid, combustible materials, such as wood, paper, cloth and the like. This modern extinguisher has a lever handle to operate and control the water jet, what may be called the seize and squeeze type. Before the lever can be pressed, a safety pin has to be removed. This extinguisher is operated by pushing the safety stirrup to one side, sharply striking the plunger to break an internal seal, and then pressing the valve by the nozzle to discharge and control the jet of water. Should there not be a nozzle valve, the jet will start as soon as the plunger is struck and will continue until all the water is used up. Here we have a foam extinguisher. Now it's coloured cream and is suitable for use on burning liquids, such as oils or cooking fats, particularly in large kitchens. With this extinguisher, a blanket of foam is built up across the surface of the fire. Just like water extinguishers, there are two main types with identical safety devices and methods of operation. Note that at the end of the hose is a special nozzle where the solution from the extinguisher is mixed with the air to make the foam. The BCF or Halon extinguishers are coloured green and are provided specifically for use on fires where there may be live electrical equipment involved. BCF is a vaporizing liquid, discharged from the extinguisher as a liquid, which quickly turns to gas. It works by stopping the chemical reaction of combustion. The gas itself is harmless in small quantities, but when used on a fire, the chemical byproducts combine with smoke from the fire and produce acrid fumes which should not be inhaled. BCF in a larger size extinguisher may also be used on fires caused by spillages of flammable liquids, known as running fires. And these may happen in motor transport workshops, at petrol pumps, or where LPG cylinders are stored. Another extinguisher, which is suitable for use on fires where there may be live electrical equipment, is carbon dioxide. But carbon dioxide, or CO2, is not as efficient as halon, and the extinguishers, which are colour black, are heavy and less convenient to handle. The fourth and final extinguisher we're going to be dealing with is the powder extinguisher, which is coloured blue. Powder is highly effective in dealing with flammable liquids, oils and fat fires, particularly the running fires that involve spillage of highly flammable liquids such as petrol. Powder extinguishers are also completely safe to use on fires that may involve live electrical equipment.
Nearly all fires develop slowly at first, which means that if the firefighting equipment that has been provided is used promptly and effectively, the fire can often be extinguished before any serious damage is done. Even a fire that flares up quickly can be controlled through prompt action. However, remember what I said at the beginning, that firefighting is a purely voluntary action, and only you can be the judge of how competent you feel to tackle a blaze. You can go a long way towards being a competent first aid firefighter if you are familiar with the equipment provided, able to identify the different fire extinguishers, know their methods of operation, and how to handle and use them. But you should also remember that knowing how to use a fire extinguisher is not the end of the matter. You must also use common sense, like knowing when not to tackle a blaze because it's gone too far for the portable extinguisher to be effective. The points to remember are, never advance towards a fire without ensuring that your line of retreat is open. Never enter a smoke-logged room in case you are overcome. Don't attempt too much firefighting. The general rule should be one fire, one extinguisher. If a fire is not out or under control by then, get out and leave it to the fire brigade. So remember the correct procedures if you discover a fire. Sound the fire alarm, shout fire, then call the fire brigade. If you feel confident, then and only then, use an extinguisher to tackle the blaze. But if you have any doubts at all, then get out. <laughs>